Hello and welcome all of to a video in which we will be looking at an aspect that gets overlooked in basketball. Like how technology has developed the basketball shoes we have today, made specially to make the players have the best performance possible, along with other technological innovations which have also developed basketball along the years. As well as talk about the science of basketball, so let's do this. Can you believe it that players like the legendary Will Chamberlain, who scored 100 points in a game, yes, 100 points, in the 60s were all-star converts, and now they use Nike Hyperdunk? Things have really changed. Ballers, can you imagine having to play basketball with some all-stars? Because, to be honest, I can. These shoes, the Nike Hyperdunk, were released in 2008 in the USA, later on to a few other countries. These shoes are specially done and modified to enhance players' performances. Nowadays, the shoes are so advanced that they capture performance as well as information on a player's movement and then send the information to the NBA app on people's phones. These sensors in the soles of the shoes track all of the movement and sync them to your phone and tell how hard, quick and high, high you jump. Some players even have their own shoes like Kevin Durant with the KD12s or even LeBron James with the LeBron 17s. So the Nike Hyper Dunks are really strong, safe and lighter for the NBA players to use and feel really comfortable. Sports view is technology has really developed the NBA because now not only do the players statistically by points, rebounds, assists, blocks, steals, and field goal percentage, but now they can take a deeper look into the analytics of basketball. Basketball, more than any other sport that I have ever accomplished for some time, is very driven by data. And what the sports for you allows us to do is see how the points were scored, where they were scored from, and how as well as the rebounds, if the rebounds were contested, if the shots were contested, or anything else. It's no coincidence that all 30 of the NBA teams now have sports for you. That says something about this new technology. Sport, sports for you is, is also extremely useful to check the statistical picture for all the other NBA teams that you were coming up against. Now, let's look at something that has impacted basketball significantly, but was not created for basketball, social media. Now, with social media, people keep updated much more about basketball through media like Instagram, Twitter, uh, to talk about YouTube, amongst others. With social media, Fans can also check the media reactions and debates about what is going on through the course of the game, especially in Twitter, which they were not able to do before. But, however, some people prefer when there was no social media because they say, quote, it was less toxic before. And you, you even have certain players like Kawhi Leonard, which don't have social media. Nowadays, it's easier to get into players' heads with social media. However, in contrast to that, nowadays with social media, athletes can interact much more with fans, which fans love, teammates, and as well as watch videos from other teams. Social media has also been very beneficial for brands and athletes because now it is easier to get your name out there and promote yourself through marketing via social media. Now we will get into officiating. There are certain technologies that have obviously made technology become much better and for the games to become much fair. First obvious one is the shot clock which made basketball personally much more fun to watch and made possessions more quicker and which gave the NBA teams to challenge organizing a play to convert in 24 seconds and that is why I love basketball so much. The NBA teams now have sports for you. That says something about this new technology. 
exploit, exploit field is, is also extremely useful to check the statistical picture for all of the other NBA teams that you are coming up against to see how you can punish them and what you can take advantage of. Now we will get into the officiating. There are certain technologies that have made officiating obviously much better and for the games to become much more fair. First obvious one is the shot clock which made basketball personally much more fun to watch and made possessions much quicker which gave the team the challenge organizing a play to convert in 24 seconds. That is why we love basketball so much. I mean, can you imagine if there wasn't a shot clock? How basketball would be played? I mean, I would personally stop watching the whole basketball games and I, I'm pretty sure a lot of people would too. I'm pretty sure I would stop watching basketball at all. I imagine the winning team holding the ball for the last minute or so and I'm trying to score and this and I and because of that I'm so happy that that the NBA has changed and now we have the shot clock. Some of you might be more familiar with the VAR in football. This instant replay has basically the same concept. Concept. Uh, anytime there is a basket or foul before the end of each quarter, referees check their screens to see if they happened before or after the buzzer so that they can make the right call. And also when a referee is not sure about a call they made or if they, they had the call challenge, they can look back at the play on the little TV and review the call and make the right decision hopefully on the play which makes the game much more fair which will end up benefiting most of us, isn't it right? There are also other technological innovations that have helped the development of basketball that I'm not mentioning, like the, the likes of mobile devices, wearable technology, amongst others. Now, let's talk science. Yeah, I know you guys are excited, so let's get straight into it. When basketball was first invented by the legend himself, Dr. James Naismith, players used a soccer ball, but then they changed and created a basketball. Because soccer balls were too smooth to play basketball, that is because in football you're not required to grip the ball, and in basketball you are. People struggled to play basketball with football back then, as they couldn't dribble, shoot, or hold it properly. That is how the orange and black ball we call basketball today was then original. Basketball started play, being played with a bigger ball then and that is how we can today play the great game of basketball that we play. The basketball also requires more friction than the football because it makes it easier to pass dribble and shoot because it's less slippery. For those of you who don't know, friction refers to the resistance that one specific solid has when moving into another. When you push an object, there's this resistance that pushes it back and that, my friends, is friction. Basketball players lick their hands to put more friction in the ball and add more friction. With a basketball, the first times you drop the ball, the ball will bounce very high and as you keep on bouncing, the basketball will start bouncing lower all the time. Inside a basketball, the air is pressurized, which means that there's more air molecules inside the basketball than outside it. The more pressure there is on a ball, the faster the air molecules are moving inside a basketball and the more kinetic energy there is. Now let's talk about kinetic energy, which refers to the energy of the objects in motion. What pushes a basketball back up from the ground is the energy of the compressed air. Now, the, the gravity and the friction of air surrounding a basketball make it, make it come back down after it's been bounced because it acts against the levitation of the ball and pulls it down. The reason that a ball is really pumped uh, bounces higher than one that isn't is because the energy of the compressed air inside a basketball pushes the ball back up from the ground and also 
and also that will make it bounce longer than a flat ball. We all love seeing these great shooters lighting it up from distance. For most basketball fans, it's their favorite thing to watch. We enjoy watching the likes of a Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, James Harden, and for the old school fans, Larry Bird. Now we'll be looking at the science behind shooting a basketball. Shooting a basketball requires you to have the right positioning of your body. But why do different players have different shooting forms? Shooting is more about practice than technique, which is contrary to what a lot of people say and think. You can have a really bad and ineffective technique and still be a great shooter, as long as, as it's just a few details that are wrong. There's no specific shooting form that works for everybody, which is why you have so many great shooters with different shooting forms. There are certain ways that, but there, however, there are certain ways that that have been proven to be more effective to the majority of the people. There is also more science behind how a basketball bounces. I will leave the link in the description, and if any of you are interested, you you guys can check it out. I will look over the rules of shooting right now. According to Gintaris Duda, which is Dr. Creighton University, in order for you to shoot a perfect three-pointer, your arm should be at 33 degrees from the hand before the ball leaves the basket, so that you have a much bigger chance of scoring. According to the study, in order to shoot an almost perfect three-pointer, 20.9 feet away from the basket, you must shoot with an arc of 45 degrees and just under 20 miles per hour at two revolutions per second of spinning a basketball. I know this is hard information to, to just remember, but try and pay close attention. For those who don't know what it is, revolution refers to the number of rotations in one minute. This study also suggests that most most important aspect of shooting a three-pointer is, is art. He also did a study, he came to this conclusion after doing a study on, on Ray Allen and I'll leave the link in the description if you want to check more about it, where he has some calculations. The speed in which a basketball is released doesn't suggest how fast the basketball will go, but it also suggests the distance it will travel. When you shoot the ball, you should also add a backspin as it makes you get a higher chance of making a shot. According to the book, The Physics of Basketball, in order for, you, for a ball to travel slowly in the air, which is proven to be really effective a lot of the times because it has a soft touch on the back room, the rim, the ball must have a backspin. On to our last point about shooting a basketball. Strength is a really important factor. According to Isaac Newton's third law, there is an equal and opposite reaction. When players shoot a basketball, they apply force to the ground and then force applies back up so that then they can jump. As he jumps, the force that allows him to jump is put into the ball before it travels with that force. So basically, the more force player puts on the ground, the more force there is on the ball. And that's why you see most of the players, coaches, putting a lot of emphasis on the legs before shooting the basketball. So when you're shooting, the lower body matters as much as the upper body, which a lot of people don't know. If you want to make shots consistently, keep on practicing because eventually you'll make more shots and shots more consistently. Remember to look over some of the rules that we look over when it comes to shooting a basketball, which will end up benefiting your shooting form and you as a player. I would like to also address a matter that concerns me as a basketball fan, to see how these women are putting a lot of their effort, time and sacrifice into basketball, but they are not always getting treated in the right way. Let's take a deeper look into this problem. WNBA players have been very vocal about their concerns regarding the WNBA. Elizabeth Cambridge, which is a WNBA player, which is scoring 
She scored the most points in the WNBA game in 53 and had had her name called out on Travis Scott and Drake's song. She's been very sad with the unfair treatment of the WNBA, which has led to her dealing with depression and then aban not only abandoning the WNBA, but basketball for some time. Liz Cambage came into the WNBA in 2011 and then left the league because of a lot of problems. She then tried to, to come back from retirement in 2013, but she claimed the things were still the same. So she left the game once again. For the time that Liz Elizabeth Cambridge was not playing, she was, she was not playing in the WNBA, she was overseas like other WNBA players because they say they're not treated the way they deserve. If they go overseas, they they used to earn 10 to 15 times as much as they as, as they earn in the WNBA. But now the number has decreased because now with the new CBA rules, the WNBA players earn much more. This Cambage then came back in 2017 to the WNBA scared, but now she claims she's enjoying her time in the NBA. Liz Cambage has now gotten used to how things work and she tries to just enjoy basketball in the WNBA besides the, all the overwhelming concerns. This is a biased point of view, but she's right. Now we'll look at what Liz Cambage thinks should be changing the WNBA. First, let's talk about wages. The WNBA should be earning more money than they do as the worst player on an NBA team earns far more than a whole NBA team. So basically, unless you earn minimum NBA salary, you'll make more money than a whole WNBA team. Yes, I know they don't give the revenue that the NBA does. I'm not asking for equal pay, I'm asking for better pay. The NBA are guaranteed around NBA players are guaranteed around 50% of the league's revenue and the WNBA players have only recently, like about 2-3 weeks ago, been guaranteed 50% too of the league's revenue. They used to be guaranteed 20% and I am so happy that the new CBA rules that were installed have given the, the WNBA players more opportunity and have made things much more fair for them well as giving them more motivation because as we can see by this time it's one of the greatest WNBA players who ever lived they just use motivation they, they just they play much more overseas than the actual US I really think we as basketball fans should inspire other people to grow basketball for women and just basketball in general as they, they're less motivated as women are less motivated These players don't even have time to relax. So they go overseas in the offseason because a lot of them need money, which is the same. And I am pleased that they're making a much bigger effort right now. In the WNBA, one of the biggest issues that Liz Cambridge mentioned is that teams are not marketed as teams, but instead they're marketed as advertising billboards to quote Liz Cambridge. A lot of jerseys in the WNBA just have sponsors in front and don't even include the name of the team, which is, which in this case would be the, the Dallas Wings, which, which is really disrespectful. Look at this image. How can this be acceptable? Like, I am shocked. This is a huge disrespect for the players and we seriously need a change. Women's basketball is not famous anywhere, but in certain countries that are in Europe, Oceania, and Asia, women earn much more than they earn playing basketball in the WNBA. That's why a lot of players go overseas. Stars from these countries earn roughly five to 10 times as much as WNBA stars earn. Can you see how concerning the situation is? Women are getting more and more demotivated to play basketball, which might be what they used to love the most and what they were best at. At least the WNBPA is, is now making a huge effort, which I like to see with these new CBA rules that will end up benefiting all the women playing basketball. In this moment, I would like to honor 
the legend that passed away in Eddie Stern. Great commissioner, person who not only changed but revolutionized the game of basketball as an NBA commissioner. So for that, I would like to thank you, legend, and give him and his family the best condolences. Thank you everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed and had fun watching.